The message is really very simple. I teach people to love themselves because I find that this is the answer for almost everything. You see, I believe that we're all 100% responsible for everything in our lives. I think we create all of our experiences by our thinking, feeling patterns. The thoughts we think and the words we speak are enormously powerful. And it's almost as though we think a thought or we speak a word and it goes out from us and it comes back to us as experience. Now we learn how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about life when we are very, very little. By the time we are three to five years old, we have a total mindset about who we are and what life is all about. And from then on, we keep reacting to experiences through this mindset. And while very often these thoughts that we have and these beliefs that we create or decisions that we make or agreements that we make at that age are very good and they help us to survive in what may be a very difficult situation, we often take them forward into life so that when we become adults, we're still operating out of a three-year-old mentality or a three-year-old decision. And that often doesn't work in our life. So we learn these things when we're very young and we usually learn them from our parents. And this is not to blame them because I really do believe that we're all victims of victims. And that it isn't possible for anybody to teach us anything that they don't know. If your mother didn't know how to love herself, there's no way she could teach you how to love yourself. And if your father didn't know how to love himself, then he couldn't teach you how to love yourself. And if you grew up in a family that was very angry or frightened, then you're likely to be an angry or frightened person because that's what you learned as a child. It's not right or wrong or good or bad, it just is. Again, it doesn't matter what the problem is or how long you've had it or how difficult or chronic it is or anything else or whether it's brand new or whether it runs in the family. There's only one thing I ever teach anyone and that is loving the self. Because when we really love and appreciate and acknowledge who we are at this point in time and space, it's like little miracles happen everywhere. And life begins to flow for us and we do what I call getting the green lights in the parking places and all those little things that make life so wonderful. And when we don't love and appreciate who we are, then we put up the barriers and the resistance to our own good. Now, I'm not talking about vanity because that, that, or arrogance because that is not love. That is fear. I'm just talking about appreciating the being that we are. And I do a lot of work with people with mirrors. Uh, you might, I'm gonna ask you if you could open your arms, please. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because this is always a gesture of, of shutting off. And it's interesting to notice what is being said when we do that. Now I can remember when I used to live my life, of, well, I, I lived like this. I was always like this. People would say, are you cold? And we say, oh no, I'm not cold. I was terrified. I was frightened. I didn't want to let anything new in because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what would happen. And when I work with people, when I workshops or classes or anything, I always try to get people just to open their arms so that we can let the new in. Remember, this is the subconscious mind and this is where we're holding. So this is saying nothing new will get in. So I always like to feel that I'm open and receptive to new ideas and I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to change and I'm willing to grow. And sometimes I don't want to and sometimes it hits areas that I don't really care to change at the moment. And you know, that's always an area that I know is important for me to work on. Another thing I do a lot with people is I do mirror work. I have people do their affirmations in a mirror I have people talk to themselves in mirrors. 
uh, I suggest that you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is you go to the mirror before you go to the bathroom or do anything you know when you're really at your most delightful go to the mirror and say I love you and what can I do for you today to make you happy and you may not get an answer for a while because you're, th that part of you doesn't trust you. But if you start doing that, you'll find a very good connection. A very healing thing to do is just a couple of times a day for a month or so is to look in a mirror in your own eyes and say, I love you. I really, really love you. And just let all those feelings come up and notice them. And if it's difficult for you to do that, notice that it's difficult for you to look in your own eyes and say, I love you. And ask yourself, now where did that nonsense come from? Remember, little tiny babies, when they're born, they absolutely adore themselves. And they're totally open, and they're full of love. They express themselves freely. They ask for what they want. They love their bodies from the top of the toe to the top of their head to the tip of their toes and every point in between, including their own feces, which they'll gladly rub all over their bodies because nobody's taught them guilt and shame. They know how wonderful they are. And then somewhere along the line, we get this idea that we're not good enough. And we start putting our tape, tape measures around our waistline to tell us if we're acceptable. Or we read magazines that say we have to be a certain height or a certain weight before we're acceptable. Or we listen to the media that says we have to use a certain deodorant before we're acceptable. You know, it just doesn't make sense. We are absolutely divine, magnificent expressions of life, all of us. And like when we were in the circle looking at each other, we each face is another unique expression of God. And we're not supposed to be alike. Since time began on this planet, there have not been two snowflakes alike. And there's certainly not been two people alike. And we're always trying to be like everybody else so we're acceptable. Our uniqueness is what makes us wonderful. So we want to love that and cherish it and acknowledge it. You see, if we really believe in our uniqueness and the wonder of each being, then there is no competition and no comparison. There can't be. We're just different. And we're meant to be different. And that's wonderful. And that's another thing we can acknowledge in the mirror. Do your affirmations in the mirror. How many people do affirmations on a daily basis? Well, OK, let's talk about affirmations for a moment. Every single thought we have or every sentence we speak is an affirmation. And it's either positive or negative. And it's going out from us and it's creating our experiences. However, when we talk about doing affirmations, what we're talking about is making definite positive statements to create something in our life or to remove something in our life. You see, if you stand there and say, I don't want this job, or I don't want this relationship, or I don't want these hips, or I don't want whatever, that does not get you what you want. That's what I call fighting the negative. And it doesn't do anything but keep what you have that you say you don't want. However, if you start saying and doing affirmations that I have a wonderful new job, or I have this most absolutely marvelous relationship, then you're beginning to create what it is you do want. Affirmations are like planting seeds. And if you think for a moment, when you put a seed in the ground, you do not get instant tomato plant or instant strawberries or instant oak tree. That seed goes in the ground and it has to germinate. That's the first thing, which means it breaks open its little shell and little roots begin to go down and it gets nourishment from the earth. And only then does the first little shoot come up through the ground. Now, when we're doing affirmations, too often people say, well, that isn't a million dollars, and they stomp on that first little shoot. <laughs> they don't give it a chance to grow. <laughs> doing affirmations is like planting a seed in the ground, and watering is it, it is like repeating your affirmations. And you just keep doing them, and you keep doing them, and you keep doing them. And it doesn't matter whether you see the results or you don't see the results. And Sometimes it just takes time. 
And too many people will do affirmations for two or three days and say, see, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, if everything happens in the perfect time-space sequence, and we want to trust that and we want to know that. So if you begin to do affirmations for yourself, and I think it's important that we do that on a daily basis, decide what you want and begin to do positive statements in present tense for what you want. You never want to say, I will have or I'm going to have, because if you do that, it keeps it in the future. And remember, if you say, I have a wonderful new apartment and you're living in a dump, it doesn't mean that this is not a true statement. It means you are planting the seed that will germinate and grow and become the new apartment. So you just keep doing it, no matter what you, where you are. Also, if you're leaving a situation, if you're in a job you don't like, if you're in a relationship you don't like, if you're in a, a house you don't like, and you want something new, begin to bless with love. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> bless with love where you are. And, and know that you're releasing your current situation with love. If it's a job, release it with love to the next person who will be delighted to have it. If it's an apartment, do the same thing. If it's a relationship, release that person with love to happiness which is meaningful to them. And that leaves you free to create and accept happiness that is meaningful to you. Some of you know my little blue book and the fact that I've been doing a lot of work with dis-ease for a long time. And for every part of the body, there is a mental pattern. And for every dis-ease in the body, there is a mental pattern. And when you know what they are, you can begin to change the mental patterns so that you can change the dis-ease. You see, we don't want to be sick. No, that's a blanket statement. Sometimes people do want to be sick because it's a good way to get out of something the rest of us know how to say no. If you don't know how to say no, you may have to create an illness in order to say no. Because that's, we've made in society, we've made that a legitimate way of, of getting out of things. But basically, we do not want to be ill, and yet we need every dis-ease that we have, because it is the body's way of telling us that there is a false idea in consciousness. Something that we're doing, something that we're believing, something that we're saying is not for our highest good. And the body is saying, please, and it's sort of almost like tugging, saying, pay attention. So, when we know what these patterns are, it gives us again a choice of whether we wish to do something about it or not. See, some people do not want to release their diseases. I read something very interesting the other day. It seems that only 30% of people who go to doctors follow instructions. Most people go to doctors not to cure their illness, but to have the acute symptoms relieved so that they can stand it. <laughs> And, this, and, and it's like an unspoken agreement between the doctor and the patient that the doctor on one level almost promises not to cure them if the patient will pretend that they're doing something about it. And for this, one person gets to pay and the other person gets to have the authority. Very, very few people will really do what they're told. See, I have a thing, when I was seeing people, that I got to the point where I would not see anyone who did not make their own appointment. I have found occasionally people have sent people to me as a present. Oh, you must go see Louise. Here, I'll give it to you as a present. Every one of those has turned out to be a disaster. Half the time the people didn't turn up. When they did turn up, they weren't really interested. When they seemed to be interested, they never went away and did anything. Or if they did, it was a little bit, and they never came back. We have to be ready to do it ourselves. Remember, each person has come to this planet to learn a lesson. You have your lessons, you have your lessons, I have my lessons, you have your lessons. They're all different. We cannot learn the other person's lessons. We are not here to change other people. We are here to change ourselves. That is what we've come to the planet for, to change ourselves. If we try to do it for someone else, 
or learn their lesson or make it nice, they don't get to learn it. And even if we fix it, isn't it amazing how they turn around and recreate it again? And we all know people like that. We've paid their rent, or we've gotten them out of some mess, or we've done this for them or that for them. And two months later, they're in the same problem because it's their pattern. It has nothing to do. Teaching them how to get out of it, it is much better if they're willing to learn. So it's like, you know, the student must come to the teacher. And when the student is ready, the teacher is there always. Let's talk a little bit about disease in the body. And I'd like to just generally go through the body on the different parts and different patterns. The head, basically, metaphysically, represents us. This is what we see of each other. Most of us, most of the time, wear clothes and we're pretty well covered up. However, the heads show. So this represents us. And when there is something wrong in the head, it usually means that we're feeling very bad about ourselves. You know, headaches are almost always invalidating the self, which means making yourself wrong for something. And the next time you get a headache, you might just ask yourself, how am I making myself wrong? What have I just done that I'm putting myself down for? And see if you can't forgive yourself for it and allow that loving, accepting energy to flow. I mean, even if you've made a tremendous goof, so what? Take it as a learning experience, not as an excuse to beat yourself up. Because that doesn't do any good. When you punish yourself, you don't learn anything. The ears are the capacity to hear the truth. And when there are problems with the ears, it usually means that on some level we do, uh, we're not happy about what we're hearing. You know, earaches are very, very common in little children. Little kids have earaches all the time. And I think it comes from two things. One, they hear a lot of stuff that they get angry about and they can't do anything about. Because <coughs> little kids are often not allowed to be angry. And also they hear no so much. And they want to shut it off. And so they get earaches. Any sore, any cut, any burn, any inflammation, any fever, any itis of any sort, any bruise is anger, any cut. All these things are anger that's turned against the self. Hair, metaphysically, is strength. Now, it's interesting when you think about how hair grows. The hair grows through the hair follicle. And very often, when we get tight and tense and nervous, we have it started back here in the shoulders, we bring it up through the neck and over the top of the scalp, and very often we bring it down around the eyes too. But when the scalp is really tight and the hair can't breathe, then it falls over and dies. And if we keep that scalp really tight with tension, the new hairs can't grow through, and we get what we call baldness. Now, just for a moment, I would like everybody in the room to relax their scalp. Okay. Did your scalp move? Yes. You don't have to tell me. Just know yourself. That means that you normally keep your scalp in a state of tension. And it might be a wonderful exercise for you about ten times a day to just say, scalp, you can relax. <laughs> just let go. And begin to make a habit of relaxing your scalp. Tightening your scalp does not do anything in the world. Doesn't make you brighter or stronger. Won't get the girl or the guy. It doesn't lose anything. It just, it, all it does is make tension for you. So let your scalp relax. The eyes are the capacity to see. And when there are problems with the eyes, it means that there's something we're not willing to see or we're afraid to see, or we don't know how to see. It can be past or present or future. It can be part of our life or all of our life. Or we can see life through two different ways. If you have astigmatism, it's like we see life in two different directions. I do not believe that the reason people begin to wear glasses is that they're getting older in middle age. I think that what happens is many people spend a lifetime of saying, I don't want to see that, I don't want to look at that, don't show me that. I don't, don't let me see that. And remember, the eyes, the cells in the body began to listen 
to what we're saying. They hear everything. And they begin to turn the sight off. When I see a little child wearing glasses, I know they always know there's stuff going on in that family they don't want to look at. The mouth is the capacity to break down ideas for analysis and decisions and discrimination and taste like you would food. Teeth problems are almost always long-standing indecision. The throat is the avenue of expression. This is where we express ourselves. This is where we say, I am, and I want, and I have, and I will. This is where our creativity flows. And it's also the area, the chakra center in our body where change takes place. When we feel we don't have a right to speak up for ourselves, we often have throat problems. And laryngitis, sore throats are just anger, and laryngitis is literally being so mad that you cannot speak. Thyroid has to do with creativity, thyroid problems. And you, it's not expressing ourselves. People who have thyroid problems usually do what their mothers want, or their fathers want, or their husbands, or their lovers, or their wives, or their bosses, somebody else, but not themselves. And you could say, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, things with thyroid and goiter in the Midwest, but then where are people more bound by what the neighbors think? and the shoulds of life. All right, shoulders have to do with burden bearing, carrying the, world of the, the weight of the world on your shoulders, taking other people's problems and carrying them, and not being free to shoulder your own responsibilities. However, we can make light of them. They don't have to be heavy burdens. The experiences we have in life do not have to be heavy burdens. They can be experiences. There are certain things in life that are normal and natural to life. And it's part of our experience. Being born, growing up, having relationships, ending relationships, getting jobs, ending jobs, getting married, having babies, people dying dying ourselves. These are normal and natural parts of life. And they're experiences that we're all meant to go through so that we have that experience. Arms and hands hold and embrace ideas and events and situations and experiences. And when we have problems with the arms, it usually means that there's some experience that we're going through that is difficult to embrace or perhaps it's too much. The lower part of the arm has to do with the, or your abilities and the upper part, your capacity. Now I've noticed something that when people uh, nurse someone who has been ill for a long time, they often have upper arm problems. It's like they have the ability to do it, but their capacity gets stretched and it becomes too much and it's almost a burden. Hands hold and grasp, and they hold lightly and lovingly or they clutch. And when there are problems with the hands, it usually means that there's something that you're experiencing and going through that is too difficult to handle. There's a problem with it. Fingers have to do with details. Our back, the back is the support of life. This is where we're supported by life, where we feel supported by life. And when there are problems with the back, it usually means that on some level we feel that we're not supported. The upper back has to do with the feeling of the lack of emotional support. It's like my, my husband doesn't support me, or my wife doesn't support me, my lover doesn't support me, my friends don't support me, my boss. Feeling unsupported. The middle back has to do with guilt, all that stuff back there. And the lower back usually has to do with finances. And where do we have so much problems with the lower back? Sciatic nerve is almost always money. Fear of money, not money itself, but the fear of it. And it has absolutely nothing to do with how much you have. It's how you feel about it. 
You know, so many people think that money is the most important thing in the world, and if they don't have money, they would just die. But that's not true. There's a substance that is far more precious and far more important to us that we literally can't live without. What is that? Love. Love. No, plenty of people are miserable and lonely most of their life and, and, and live. Air. 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 Your air, your breath. Your breath is the most important thing that you have, the most precious thing. If you didn't take another breath, you wouldn't last three minutes and you'd never get out of this room. And yet we absolutely take for granted that our next breath is there. Look at us, we're all in this room breathing and I'm not saying, don't breathe, there's not enough for me. We assume that it's there. And when we exhale, we don't think about where's my next breath coming from. Now, if the power that created us has given us enough breath to last for as long as we shall live, can we not begin to trust that the other things will take care of themselves? See, life is here for us. Life is here to support us, to take care of us, to be here for us. The entire planet has been put here for us to play with. We have everything that we shall ever need. It's already here. Only we have to know it, and we have to trust it, and we have to acknowledge it. Do you realize that there is more food on this planet than people could possibly eat? There's an incredible amount of food. Yes, it is true that there are people starving. But the food is here. There is more money on this planet than we know how to count. The money is here. Now, there are lots of people who are very broke, but the money is here. There are billions of people on this planet. And yet you will have people tell you that they're lonely. It has nothing to do with not being people. It's what we're doing with our heads. Everything is here for us. For every dis-ease on this planet, there is a plant that will cure it. Everything, everything is here for us. And the more we begin to trust life and acknowledge the beauty and magnificence of our own being, the more we find everything we need. It just pops up. Okay. Lungs have to do with taking in life. This is the breath of life. This is where we take in life. And we have the ability to take in just enough to get us by, or we can fill our lungs and really have all the cells in the body work well and our brain cells work well. Traditionally, for generations and generations, women have been very shallow breathers because we bought this story that said we're not good enough, that we're second-class citizens. And we began to believe that we didn't have the right to take up very much space, and we barely had the right to exist, and so we take in just about enough air to keep us going. <laughs> That's changing now, and it's wonderful. And one of the things that really excites me today is what's happening with women in the gyms. You know, we have worked in the fields for a very long time, but I think this is the first time that I'm aware of where women have really gone out for sports. And you see some of the female bodies in the gyms these days that go out and exercise. They are incredibly magnificent, They're just wonderful. And they are taking in life and taking up space and taking air. And I think it's beautiful. So people who have lung problems, people who smoke too much, people who have emphysema and things like that, they're cutting life off. They're saying on some level, I don't deserve to exist. Or I only deserve to exist a little bit. Breasts have to do with mothering and nourishment. And when there are problems with the breasts, there's either a mothering problem or a nourishing problem. It's very similar. We can overmother people or situations or places, and then we get into trouble. However, every woman that I've come in contact with that has breast cancer does not nourish herself. It's like you give and give and give and give, and they're not taking nourishment for themselves. And of course, there is resentment about it. See, resentment is a pattern that eats away at the body and becomes cancer. Resentment and anger are very different. Anger is and you scream and yell like a baby. Babies get angry instantly. And they yell and shriek, and then they're through. 
And two minutes later, their smiles will just light up a room because they've gotten it out. What we do is we take offense at somebody for having done something that we created to begin with <laughs> because we're all 100% responsible and we don't do anything about it and we put it down in here and we start to let it seethe and it boils and it eats away at us and if we have it long enough we can create cancer. See, diseases like arthritis are, are created from things, patterns of criticism. Arthritic people are always very, very critical people. Now, they may be sweet on the outside, but that means that the criticism is turned inward and they're doing a constant negative put-down number on themselves. Fear can come out as anything from baldness to ulcers to poor feet and lots of things in between. Uh, guilt always seeks punishment and punishment creates pain. So if I see somebody who has pain, I know they're dealing with guilt. And if it is chronic pain, then I realize that the pattern may be so old that they're not even aware of what it is. However, I do know it has to, a lot to do with I'm not good enough. So we want to nourish ourselves. The heart represents love. Love. The heart represents love. And the blood in the body, metaphysically, is joy. So if you get this image of the heart lovingly pumping joy throughout the body, through all the veins and arteries and nourishing every single cell in the body, that is the normal, natural state of the body. When we cut off our joy, when we deny ourselves love, then we are stopping our hearts from doing their wor the proper work. See, heart attack people are never joyous people. Besides, the heart does not attack us. What we do is we spend years squeezing the joy out of the heart until it falls over and gets sick. Now, anemic people are what I call yes but people. You, you know, you, they come to you with a problem and you say, well, you could do such and such. Oh, yes, but. <laughs> or, or you say, let's go to the movies. And they go, oh, yes, but. It's like they're just pulling that rug out from under themselves all the time. And they get what we call tired blood. <laughs> the blood doesn't have the joy flowing through it. Now, high blood pressure is like emotional sprees. Everything becomes a big deal. Everything is a huge deal. And again, it may be not on the surface. It may be only be inside. And low blood pressure is just the opposite. Low blood pressure and hypoglycemia are very similar. It's like, what's the use? It won't work. Why try? Don't bother. <laughs> it's just, again, you know, it's just, there's this, <laughs> no get up and go. <laughs> All right. Uh, kidneys have to do with disappointment and failure and fear. And you know, the word kid, kidney, has the word kid in it. And if you think of a little child, they can drop their lollipop and it is the tragedy of the world. The whole world has ended for them at that moment. People who have kidney problems have a tendency to react to life in the same way. They make huge deals out of experiences. And if you speak to anybody who's on a dialysis machine, you will find out that about two months before that happened, they experienced what they considered a big loss in their life, either a relationship or a house or a job or something like that. And it's like they just, they, they, they can't, they feel they can't go on. They just can't go on. They don't know how to filter that experience through them. The liver is the laboratory of the body. It does over 500 different functions and it is also the seat of primitive emotions. So, when we are very angry, that's like rage and anger and hatred sit in the liver. And when they do, then they create a lot of problems. If you're a very angry person, you can throw your liver off. If your liver is off, you can become a very angry person. For instance, everybody in AA is an angry person. You've got two givens with anybody in AA, a lot of self-hatred and a lot of anger. 
and both of those need to be dissolved before the, the real healing can take place. Uh, stomach. Stomach digests ideas. We have taken in, it's, it's intake, assimilation, and elimination. So the stomach is there to assimilate ideas. And very often when new experiences happen, we have problems assimilating them. It's something outside. Bells go. It's all right. It, we'll assimilate this experience. <laughs> and they have a right to make some noise. You know, when, if a noise happens and it disturbs you, if you give it permission to be there, it's amazing what happens. Like we give that permission to make that noise. And then it sort of goes away from our consciousness. People get very frightened about experiences and they find it difficult to digest them. You see, ulcers, remember, are nothing more than I'm not good enough. It's fear, that's all it is. Only it's a fear of, with the boss. It's another way of saying I'm not good enough. You know, thinking just for a moment of uh, how the stomach works on a mass scale, when airplanes came in a few years ago, God, they must be here, what, 20, 30 years now? But anyway, when they first came out, Remember, they had the little throw-up bags at every single seat. <laughs> and everybody, we were flying, but this was a new idea that we did not know how to stomach. The idea of getting in a little metal tube and going through the sky and getting down on another place was not something that we could stomach easily. So everybody was throwing up into their little bags and they'd roll them up and hand them down to the aisle, pass them down the aisle to the stewardess who was running up and down the aisles collecting these bags because people were throwing up, we were frightened. Now it's many years later and we've digested the idea of flying and it's very simple now for us. And while the bags are still there, hardly anybody's throwing up. And the last time I was on American Airlines, I noticed that if you put three stamps on it, you could send it off and have your film developed because no, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's throwing up anymore. They had to do something with it. Okay. Uh, where are we now? Da, 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 da. Spleen has to do with obsession. We become obsessed about things. All right. The colon is elimination, release, and letting go. And when we are constipated, it literally means that we're holding on to old shit. That's all it is. We won't let go. We won't let people, things release. This, remember, intake, assimilation, and elimination. And I like to think of it all being in divine right order. And there are times when we stop it at different places. So people who are very constipated are usually holding on to old ideas that they don't want to let go of. They're stuck in some place. Sometimes they're very stingy people, but not always. And diarrhea is just the opposite. It's letting go of things too fast. It's fear. It's just pure fear. I remember the very first time I did a play. I did opening night on Kaopectic. <laughs> a whole bottle. On, on the surface level, I was fine. I was having a wonderful time, and everything was wonderful. On the internal level, level the little kid was shit scared. And that's exactly what was happening. And after opening night, it was fine. I didn't need that anymore. But at some level, I needed to go through that. Knees. OK, knees are marvelous. Knees are a little bit like the neck. They have to do with flexibility. But they also have to do with bending and pride and ego. Because this is where we kneel. This is where we bend down. This is, uh, has a lot to do with forgiveness, the knees. And you know, the ankle can get hurt. It's also a joint, and it heals very quickly. But the knees take a long time because they have to do with stubbornness and pride and ego and this self-righteous thing of not wanting to forgive. And that's why they take so long to heal. So if you hurt your knee, or you might think back about some time when you might, your knee might have been sore, ask yourself, where were you being stubborn? Where were you being unforgiving, unbending? and allow yourself to just move through that. Feet have to do with understanding. This is what we stand on. 
This is our understanding of ourself and of life. And when we have problems with the feet, again, there's something wrong with our understanding about how we are moving forward. Now, you know, little kids come into life and you see them, they're on happy dancing feet. They jump all over the place and they run and skip and dance. <laughs> and how many people have, how many elderly people have we seen that move through life <laughs> like this? <laughs> now, what kind of thoughts do you think a person could be thinking for years to create this? Hmm? I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. All right. What else? Depression. Depression. Life is a burden. Depression. Nothing works. Is There's nothing. Is. is this all there is? <laughs> I don't want to see a lot of those things. Remember, our bodies follow our thoughts. And you can look at a lot of people and know what their thoughts are just by looking at their bodies. Our skin is our individuality. And when we feel threatened by anything, we often get skin problems. When people frighten us, we feel our individuality is threatened and the skin goes. All right, let me talk a little bit about the genitals, our beautiful, beautiful genitals, which so many of us do not believe that that's true. However, the genitals are just as beautiful as any other part of our body, and they have their own special functions and they have more nerve endings than any other part of the body. They are meant to give pleasure, and that's what they're for. We have a lot of stuff about our genitals, and this is unfortunate because they either represent the most feminine part of ourselves, our femininity, our feminine principle, or they represent the most masculine part of ourselves, our masculinity, the masculine principle. And when we do not feel good about ourselves as men or women, or about our sexuality, we can have a lot of problems with our genitals. It's very, very seldom that I talk to people who were raised in a family where the genitals and their functions were called by the right names. We all had euphemisms for everything. <laughs> Let, let's share a couple of them. What were the euphemisms for you as a child? Yes? Our no no. Our no no. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? What, what else? Yes? A wee wee, yes. Nasty, nasty. Nasty, nasty. Boy, you must really. <laughs> okay, yes. Down there. Private parts. Private parts. What? Couldn't even talk about it. Do you see? And and just notice the the laughter in this room at the moment. Here we are, grown up adults. Supposedly we all have it together sexually, and the minute we mention what we called it. When we were a child, we start to giggle nervously like that we're doing something wrong. It doesn't matter really what it was. It could be from the most awful word to just sort of down there. But we get the idea that there is something wrong between our legs. And we start treating ourselves that way. And then we wind up with all sorts of sexual problems. Almost all venereal disease comes from sexual guilt. It's a belief that there's something wrong with us and our genitals. Now, you know, people that have cancer have a lot of self-hatred and a lot of resentment and usually not a very much trust in life. There's sort of a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that goes with cancer. If you add to that sexual guilt, you wind up with things like herpes and AIDS. It's like the next logical step. The sexual revolution, which came about, I think, in the 60s, as I remember, was very wonderful because it helped us to get out of a Victorian mode of thinking. And we started to do all sorts of things sexually that we hadn't allowed ourselves to do before or that we had hidden. 
See, not only did gays come out of the closets, but people came out of sexual closets. And we came, began to discover a lot more about child abuse and incest and all sorts of things that we hadn't been able to talk about before. And on one level, the sexual revolution was good. We got to express ourselves sexually much freer than we had before. Uh, women could have one night stands as well as men, and it was wonderful. However, the one thing we did not deal with was what I call mama's God. And by that I mean what your mother believed about God when you were three years old is sitting right here in your subconscious mind. What did that God believe about women, about men, about homosexuality, about sex? And if those beliefs are still there and we have not done something to change them, then what happens is we create things like herpes, which comes back again and again and again to punish you. And then if we move into the gay community, where they have every single problem that everybody else has, plus the fact that society is looking at them and saying bad, and their mothers and fathers are looking at them and saying bad, and this is a real heavy load to carry. And so we create the circumstances, the, the climate, where something like AIDS can come up. I find to myself that AIDS and cancer are very, very similar. And I work ex exactly the same way with both of them. Doing a little more to work on dissolving sexual guilt, because that's a real problem. You know, if you think for a moment about the vastness of the universe, it is so incredibly big that our human minds cannot comprehend it. It is enormous. And even our, most, our top scientists with the most up-to-date equipment today cannot measure the size of the universe. And half of them won't agree on whether it's expanding or contracting. And in this incredible universe, there are so many galaxies that we haven't counted all of them. And in one of the smaller galaxies, in a far-off corner, there is a, a call, the small galaxy called the Milky Way. In a very far off corner, there is a minor sun. And around this sun revolve a few pinpoints, one of which is called planet Earth. Now, I find it very, very hard to believe that the incredible intelligence that created this entire universe is an old man sitting on a cloud above the planet Earth watching my genitals <laughs> with a book. <laughs> and yet it doesn't compute. It does not compute. And yet how many of us were raised to believe that? And many of us are living it. If you were raised in a religion where you were a sinner and a worm and you had a lot of sexual problems and things like that, start to reevaluate. Do some mental work to change that so that you're not still operating. You can sit down and in front of a mirror would be real good. Look in your eyes and say, okay, now when I was a kid, this is what I was taught. But I'm not a child anymore. Now I am an adult and I don't believe that. I now choose to believe and then decide what you want your belief of God to be like. You see, if you're in a religion that puts you down or where you are a sinner or a worm or whatever, get another religion. There are plenty of them. <laughs> they all tell you that they're the only way. I th see, I think even our concept of God must support us. And you do not have to have the same concept of God that your parents had or your grandparents had. You don't have to. Each person is a unique individual and each one of us creates our own lifestyle and our own belief system. And it's, I think we need to constantly reevaluate what we believe. And particularly if we believe things that don't nourish us. Think, why do I believe that? Where did I learn that? Does, is that really true for me now? Does it make sense? 
maybe I could let that one go. You might create a pair of psychic scissors and cut them out of your consciousness. Or create a great big wastebasket and say, okay, that one goes there. And decide that you just do not choose to live under old limitations anymore. Refuse to believe in worry. Begin to trust the universe and watch how it works. In the infinity of life where we all are, all is perfect, whole, and complete. We are one with the power that created us, and we are now open and receptive to the abundant flow of good the universe offers us. All our needs and desires are now met before we even ask. We affirm our good comes from everywhere and from everyone and all is well in our world.